Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of 10 to Life with me, Annie Elise. I am here to break down another true crime case for you. This one has to do with some cooking, God, as gross as that sounds, if you know where I'm going, if you're a true crime buff, you kind of know where I'm going with that. Um, Some betrayal from somebody close to them. I mean, it's a mess. So let me just kind of jump right in to set the stage for you. In 2013, James Schaefer went missing after his shift working as a limo driver. Now, what happened to James and who was responsible was much closer to home than anybody expected. And the motive and the connection and the reasoning and the access began to make things much more clear. In one of the most grotesque cases to date, today we are talking about James Schaefer. So let's jump right in. So I've told you guys before how important it is for me that when I have sponsors of the channel, it's a product that I genuinely believe in and something that I use myself personally. Now you've heard about me talk about this product so many different times before, but I wanna show you it in action because I truly do use it every single night and I have for the last nine months. And that is Beam Dream Sleep Tea. And let me just show you how true this is. This is a sneak peek of my cabinet. You can see Beam Mint Chip, I'm already halfway through because I drink that. Core, it's watermelon, it's for a daily use, I use this. I've also got some other stocked up flavors here, apple cider donut flavor, my tried and true sea salt caramel, more golden milk latte. You get the point, right? Right now I'm making a cup for both my husband and I, and my husband is actually the one who got me into this about nine months ago. And now we drink it together every single night. Now for me personally, I drink it about 30 minutes before I want to fall asleep and then it helps me stay asleep. It has L-thionine in it, melatonin, magnesium. I mean, all of the dream sleep pixie dust things that you could even possibly imagine. I also have tried everything. I've tried Ambien, magnesium on its own, all sorts of things. Nothing has ever worked until I started drinking beef. That's why I'm such like a loyal customer and why I talk about it so much with you when they asked to be a partner of the channel. I was like, yes, absolutely. It's a no brainer because I personally, again, use this product every single night. And I'm not the only one that it works for. 93% of people who were in the clinical study reported better sleep, falling asleep faster, not feeling groggy in the morning, just so many different benefits. They have so many amazing flavors, but my tried and true is sea salt caramel because it literally tastes just like hot chocolate. It's like a sweet dessert treat before bed, but it's only 15 calories and there's no added sugar. And right now they are offering you 50% off your first month. All you have to do is use the link in my description box, no code necessary, it'll auto apply the discount. And you can also use my QR code if that's easier. I mean, look guys, I'm almost out of my latest pack completely and that is the proof in itself. Try it because you are not going to regret it. 36 year old James Schaefer was born on August 3rd, 1976. He grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania with his parents, Thomas and Mary, and also his two siblings, Kristen and Andrew. Growing up, he was a very talented baseball player, a huge sports fan, and he graduated from J.P. McCaskey High School before later moving to Deltona Beach, Florida. Now, Deltona, not to be confused with Daytona, is right in the middle of Disney World and Daytona Beach, and it's about 30 minutes from both. It is known for its wildlife and for feeling somewhat rural. God, I never can say that word, but it's still pretty close to a lot of things. So in 2007, James moved into a new home with his longtime girlfriend, Candy Medina, and the two were very focused on providing for and raising their three kids, Tyler, Christopher, and Talia, and also Candy's son from a previous relationship, who was named James. Now, by that point, James and Candy had been together for over a decade, but just hadn't officially gotten married yet. But when you think about it, they were living together, raising kids together, and had been together so long that it basically was just a common law marriage at this point. So at some point, James began working for a local limo driving company called Blue Diamond Limousine Company. Not only did he love his job, but everyone at his job loved him, and he very quickly became one of the preferred drivers within his company, and he was constantly requested to give people rides. On April 2, 2013, James said goodbye to Candy as he left the house for a limo assignment. The assignment that he had was driving a group from Kissimmee, Florida to Tampa and then coming back. The drive was nearly two hours there and back, and John returned and took the limo and the keys back to his work around 3 a.m. on April 3rd. He then got into a car that was waiting for him, and it drove away. 
But James never returned home, and his family started to get very worried as the time was passing. On April 4th, James's dad ended up calling the police to report him as missing, which launched a full-on investigation into his whereabouts. Now, as you all know, the first person who is usually always looked into is the spouse or the significant other of whoever is missing. And that was no different in this case. And investigators immediately went and spoke to Candy, who confirmed that she had not seen him since he left for work on the 2nd. So a missing persons poster was quickly made and put up, which described James as being 5'11", around 275 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, multiple tattoos, and last seen wearing a black dress shirt, black dress pants, and black dress shoes. Investigators also spoke with people at the limo company, who all hadn't heard from him, and they confirmed that the last time that he was seen was when he had left there, around 4 a.m., with whoever was in that car that was waiting for him that he got into. There was also lots of speculation on whether or not it was foul play. That was due to the fact that James had recently mentioned some financial issues that he was having. He had talked to a couple of people at work about this and some friends, so there was some speculation that maybe everything was fine with James, and he was just trying to leave town to avoid an upcoming rent payment, considering he hadn't paid rent in months, also had a gambling issue, and did not have any running water in the house. So as police were speaking with people who knew James and trying to find out if anyone knew anything, they ended up speaking to several people in the neighborhood. One of those people was Angela Stolt. Angela had known James and Candy since they had moved into the house back in 2007. Angela and her ex-husband had become friends with James and Candy, as did all of the kids, since they were all around each other so often. But Angela and James had gotten especially close because Angela was known to stay up super late, often into the early morning hours. And remember, James didn't usually get off work until it was really late. So it was never unusual for James to pop by Angela's after work, have some drinks together, and catch up on life. And the two of them ended up becoming extremely close. Angela called James Jimmy for short. And James and Candy even stood next to Angela through some of her hardest moments in life. And because of their late night talks, James was very aware of most of the things that Angela had gone through in her life. Angela is currently 51 years old, and to give you a little bit more background on her, she was born into a military family in Bangkok, Thailand in April of 1972. Angela's dad was in the United States Air Force, and part of that meant that their family would move around way more frequently than most kids ever would. And like many military kids, the constant moving around really had an effect on both Angela and her older sister, April. But that wasn't the only struggle in Angela's life. Angela had also been born with a thyroid condition, and in her case, from a very young age, she had increased anxiety and depression. So with the mixture of a thyroid condition, and then the constant uprooting and changing and moving, it wouldn't be hard to understand why Angela really struggled to adapt with each new move. Eventually, according to Angela, they moved to Georgia, and Angela just had an incredibly difficult time adjusting there. When she went into high school in order to fit in, she started hanging out with the wrong crowd. She ended up meeting a boy who was three years older than her, and after freshman year of high school, she dropped out, got married, and the two of them relocated to Deltona, Florida. Now, honestly, I kind of have to wonder through all of this, where the heck were her parents? Because in absolutely no world would I ever let my child get married at 15 years old and then move to a whole different state. I get that at this point, it was what, the late 80s? But still, not enough to get married as a young teen and then move into an entire new state. So I'm sure that it won't come as a surprise to you to know that that relationship ended up not working out. So they ended up getting a divorce around four to five years later. According to Angela, the divorce was because the man that she was with was very controlling, abusive, and would keep her away from her family. So after that, she jumped into another relationship fairly quickly, and she was married again at just 20 years old. Three years later, in 1996, she and her husband had a baby boy. But again, that relationship failed fairly quickly, too. But this time, Angela didn't have just herself to worry about. Now she was a divorced, single mom of a baby, struggling with mental health issues, and had nobody to turn to. So she did the only thing she really knew how to do, which was commit to another relationship. So she married a third man named Joe, and this was all by the time that she was just 25 years old. So Angela and Joe ended up having another child, a daughter together. 
and they seemed to be living an average, normal, happy life, raising their kids together, living on the same street as their friends, Candy and James. Picture perfect, right? But in 2011, the two of them split, and her husband left her completely alone to raise their two children. Angela claimed that he was toxic, just like the previous men that she had married. But now she was back to square one, having no income, and again, being a single mother, but this time two older kids. Her family ended up helping her out some, as did the government, in the form of social security payments. But when that wasn't enough to get her by, she turned to her neighbors for help, her good friends. So James let her do some bookkeeping work for him to make some extra money, and eventually he ended up getting on social security just like Angela. That was when the two of them had agreed that Angela would be the payee, or the person who received the money, and then managed it for him from there. Now, honestly, it kind of just seemed like a really weird codependent friendship relationship the more that I researched into it, because why are you putting her on the name? I guess it's easier for her to cash the checks, manage the money, do the bookkeeping, but also that coupled with going to her house late at night drinking, the lines are definitely blurred. That is not just a business transaction and you're hiring your friend to help her out. Like, there, it's a very big gray area there. But gray or not, this was their arrangement. And as the payee, her kickback for doing this would be to receive $100 from each payment, that being payment for managing the money and do, getting the checks and doing all of that. Except there was one problem with this great plan that they had come up with. The payment started out at around $1,230, and each month, James was overdrawing the account, and Angela was having to get everything rebalanced. So, of course, having this very close relationship with Angela... The police are investigating James' disappearance. They're looking for anybody who had a connection, a close relationship with him, the spouse, the partner, all of the things. So it was only natural that they speak to Angela, right? So when the police spoke to Angela, they really wanted to understand why she was the payee on that account and also how the transactions were working, namely if he had been withdrawing money in the time period that he was missing. Angela answered the questions and told them that she hadn't seen him in a few days, but that if she did, she would let them know. So after speaking with her, they felt that she was genuine, and they did not suspect any foul play, and they just moved on with their investigation. But then there was something that Candy said that really got investigators' attention, and they realized that maybe there was more to the situation than anybody was aware of. Candy told officers that she had received text messages from James on April 3rd, the same day that he disappeared, which said that he had to hide out from someone, but that he was okay. And Candy wasn't the only one who had received those text messages. Some of his friends did as well. Now, obviously, that was very alarming, and the desperation to find James became even greater as the circumstances now were becoming even more worrisome. But as the days went on and no one heard from him, they decided once again to go back and talk with Angela again, the good friend, the employee, the close relationship. Because if anyone knew something, she would be the one if his disappearance did in fact really have to do with anything money related. So they did this multiple times and she would just reiterate the same thing that she had before. One time she even offered them to come to her house and check for him. When officers went into her house, it was evident that she did have some serious mental health issues at play. The house was kind of like a hoarder's house and was completely filthy with food, dishes, and trash absolutely everywhere. There was absolutely zero cleanliness about it. But James wasn't there, so there wasn't really anything that they could do at that point besides having her do a formal interview at the station. Angela started the interview off by saying that they were not in love and that she really did just love him as a friend. She then told the detective that Candy and James had a very physically harmful relationship, with Candy as the aggressor. She also told them that James is not an addict, but he did things like cocaine and meth. Then Angela shared that she had seen James after he was reported missing, saying that he came to her house because he wanted money. He came by, he wanted the money, he got mad because I, I told him that I put it in the bank and I didn't. I didn't put it in the bank because I was waiting for the rest of it. Now, by this point, there were two detectives in the room, and the female detective began calling her out on her lies and also trying to get Angela to share where he was so that they could help him and simultaneously putting some blame and pressure on Angela for James overdrafting the account. Most of the interrogation seemed to revolve around money. 
James' irresponsibility with money and the streams of income that he had, including often stealing money from his boss with the promise to pay it back. Shockingly, Angela's ex-husband called her in the middle of the interview. The call ended very quickly after Angela told him that she was at the police station. But then the detectives asked her to call him back, telling him that she had left, and asking him if James was with him since at one point they had been best friends. During the call, they coached Angela in questioning Joe to see if he knew anything, but he didn't know anything. So later on, Angela claimed that James had gotten into an argument at work and someone had taken a knife to his throat. But that was the first time that she had mentioned it. While it definitely could be a possibility, especially since James would continually take money, why would she not say that during the initial visits that she had with the police? So then they began grilling her about James's boss. But ultimately, they didn't figure out everything in that interview, and since the focus was now on James's boss, Angela wasn't required to be in custody, so she went home. The investigation continued, and then on April 21, 2013, a call came into the Volusia County Sheriff's Office. It was a woman who claimed to have information on James's disappearance. She said that James was dead and that she knew who killed him. Apparently, a relative of hers was making suicidal comments and saying that she killed James. Now, guess who that relative was? That woman was Angela Stoltz's sister. So when police went to Angela's house, Angela was disheveled and appeared to be going through just an emotional crisis. Now, in Florida, if someone is believed to be a danger to themselves or others, police are within their right to take that person into custody to ensure that they cannot harm themselves or anybody else. Oftentimes, they get taken to a psychiatric facility for 72 hours, and this is also known as a Baker Act. So in Angela's case, she was placed in custody under the Baker Act. She was initially taken to the police station, and it was there that she asked to talk with the detectives who are working on James's case, the ones who had questioned her several times over the previous, almost now, three weeks. When the detective came in and read Angela her Miranda rights, she said, I wish you had come into my house that very first day you were there. You could have ended this before it got to this point. But then she suddenly decided to invoke her right to remain silent. However, she kept speaking. In a very careful and cautious move, the police stopped her and then took her to a psych facility. But after she went to that psych facility, she asked to speak with them again. The detectives went over to the psych hospital where they confirmed that Angela wanted to talk to them without a lawyer. She told them that she wanted to tell them what really happened to Jimmy. And remember, Jimmy is what she called him. So Angela said that in the early morning of April 3rd, her and her kids picked James up from work around 3 to 4 a.m. They returned to Angela's house to have a drink together mixed of vodka and peach schnapps. Angela told the detectives that she had spiked both glasses with a prescription-only muscle relaxer. She told them that it enhanced the drink and that James knew that it was in there and had even crushed the pills himself. While they drank, James asked her if he could borrow $2,000 to $4,000 from Angela's dad. Now, apparently, this wasn't a new thing because he had asked for money from Angela's dad in the past, so Angela told him that her father was considering it. But she was not happy that he was even thinking about asking her dad, who was dying at the time, for money. Apparently, this really rubbed her the wrong way. He wanted me to ask my father, my dying father, mm -hmm. for $2,000 to cover his thing. His, um, He's right. Yes. Okay. Angela then told detectives that around 5 a.m., she told James that they should drive to her dad's house to talk to him about borrowing the money. But instead of going to her dad's house, Angela drove to Osteen Cemetery in Deltona because it was still very early morning hours and her dad was not awake yet. While they were there, they got into an argument because Angela admitted to James that she had never even asked her dad to borrow the money. She was essentially just trying to get back at him for lying to her over certain things and followed it up by asking him how it felt to be lied to. She then told him that she and her dad would not be loaning him money and that she was also done cashing checks for him because he had put her in debt by constantly overdrafting and borrowing. She told the detectives that James became enraged and threatened to kill her and also kill her kids. So she said she took the threat seriously and she feared for her life. So she reached back into a box of camping gear and she grabbed an ice pick, which she then swung and stabbed James in the eye with. 
As the discussion went on, she said she didn't know how deep it went, but that James was screaming, still coming at her, and she was scared. So at that point, she said she grabbed for any other weapon that she could find, and wouldn't you know, the next item that she randomly grabbed was a cord with handles made of PVC pipe that she claimed she had made to use as a tree climbing tool, but it was more like a garrote, what John Bonet was essentially believed to have been killed with. She said that she wrapped it around his neck and pushed her feet against James' chest to stabilize herself as she pulled the handles back. She strangled her friend James with that cord, an ice pick still stuck in his eye, all until he was dead. Now, as if that weren't enough, she said that she took the ice pick from his right eye and jammed it into his left eye to ensure that he was dead. He said he was going to kill me. Okay. I'm going to fucking kill you. And I took him seriously. I don't... Fear took over. Okay. I had a bunch of stuff in my back seat. Um... It wasn't in the seat. It was in the floorboard. Was it behind your seat or was it, it behind, behind Jimmy's? My seat. Behind your seat, okay. And I just reached in and grabbed something because I knew there was camping stuff in there. Okay. I mean, I've been buying camping stuff for a while now, tents right. and all sorts of stuff. So we were going to go camping next month. Okay. Or as soon as it's warmed up. Sure, it's been cold at night. <laughs> I mean, it's too hot to camp during the day and too cold to camp during the night. Agreed. And I just grabbed the first thing I could and... What was it? It was an ice pick. Okay. I wrapped my hand around it and this Hmm. hand was coming towards my face. And I still got this hand over here like this, right? And I went like that with it. Okay, so I was coming at you. Or Jimmy was coming at you. Yes, I got you like this, and I'm moving towards you. And you took the pick and stuck it in my right eye? Yes, sir. And what did Jimmy do? Did he release you? No. He's still coming at still here and still coming. Did, what do you do with this hand? Did he hit your face? Did he hit you in the shoulder? What do you do? This hand comes up and does that number like that. Okay. And meanwhile, the ice pick is still in Jimmy's eye. Okay. And then... I don't know how deep it was. I I don't even know if it was that deep. Okay. I was scared. What's he saying? God damn it, I trusted you and I need that money because our whole family's going to be kicked out. Don't you fucking care that my children are going to be homeless and... I was at that point. I don't scream. I don't know how okay. very well. Sure. But I was making noises, um, like I was cussing. Well, sure. And let go of me. Okay. And he was still coming at me, so I, I go for the box of tools and stuff. Camping gear. There were some tools in there too. Mm-hmm. I don't. It was a box of stuff that I needed to go through, and I just been throwing stuff in. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Let's, we're at the point now where I'm still, I have an ice pick in my, I'm a Jimmy, I have an ice pick in my right eye, I still have my thumb right here on your shoulder, and I've got my left hand up pushing up against your face. Now, where are you in the car? Are you up against the door, the, your driver's side door? Are you in the seat? How, oh, can you give me an orientation of, well, first off, you, you say you grabbed the second thing out of the box. What was that? It was a piece of PVC pipe. A piece, or pieces, or? It was attached to a, um. It was two pieces of PVC okay. with a wire in between. What kind of wire was it? It was a, um, like a cord from a TV or something. Okay. It's something that you guys recycled. bought? Recycled. 
It's fucked up. Okay. Did you buy that or? No. How did you get that in your car? The PVC? Well, how, why was it in your car? Who, who made it? Where'd it come from? I made it. You made it? You know, I asked Max to, to put holes in the thing. Okay. But, um, what was, it was his my purpose? idea. What was the it? climb trees. It climbs trees? I threw it up and <laughs> yeah. pulled myself up. Okay, I got and you. It was like an anchor. Right? Is that for lack of a better term? I guess. I guess. It wasn't like one of those tree things. You've seen guys climb poles and they put that belt around them. Oh, no. It wasn't I like that. I didn't have nothing that fancy. Nothing that fancy. So this it thing was... was just to pull myself up and climb trees. Right so it was supposed to like catch like a... You know what a grappling hook is? It's yeah. Got, okay. Was that the purpose of this, this PVC contraption? It was something you'd throw up in some branches and then you'd pull on the other piece of PVC, right? Mm-hmm. Now, how much cord... Was in between each piece of PVC. Not that much. Wow. Okay, so enough where you could throw it pretty high, grab on, it and go. So I could climb a, a higher tree. Makes mm-hmm. sense. Makes sense to me. I I've got pictures of me climbing trees. I love to climb trees. I like okay. to be up in trees. Cool. And um, camping is about being outdoors and climbing trees. I love animals and nature. And mm-hmm. So you grab this thing and. What do you do with it next? Again, because I'm still, correct me if I'm wrong, I still have you like this, and I still, I'm still pushing up against you with my, my left hand, right? And this man's a big man, so he's got a lot of force coming at you. But I still have an ice pick in my eye. And am I saying anything else besides, hey, my eye? Because I have an ice pick in my eye. He's like, what the fuck, what the fuck? And I, I don't, he's yelling at this point. I don't know, it just went so bad. Okay. I do remember grabbing that thing. And okay, good. I think it around. How many times did you wrap it around my neck? Was it your neck? No, Jimmy's neck. Once. Okay. So he's got this thing wrapped around his neck, and what do you do next? I grab the other side of it. He has my arm like that. Mm-hmm. I grab it like this, mm-hmm. and I grab it like that, and then I put my feet. Mm-hmm. I. Hmm. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'll put more on that one, but you let me know when you're ready to continue. You ready? Okay. First of all, I put my foot like that. I okay, push go ahead. Back. You gotta, you gotta put your foot on my shoulder. Go ahead. No, I push you back. Okay, gotcha. And you, but you have each piece of the. the what's, where is this hand? You have the pieces of the PVC. Each hand's got one. Now pick your foot up. You said you were pushing on me. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. I kind of slid into his lap. Okay. So I can get my feet up like that. Okay. And gotcha. I use my feet to push. The PVC. You got each piece of the PVC, so now the rope is just around Jimmy's neck. Yeah, but he was already trying his best to push me off. So now he's pushing on you mm-hmm. to get because you're pushing, but you're countering him with your legs and you're pulling on the PVC pipe. Okay, each piece of the PVC. All right, keep going. Keep going. I remember at one time my foot slipped, and I kicked the ice pick. I pushed it deeper. So the ice pick is in my eye. You, your foot slipped up and hit the ice pick, and now it's well, driving me in the well, eye. It slipped. I... Oh, ow! <laughs> okay. And then, so you, how long does it continue? I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead. It lasts for so long, and then I just I was so scared. I just wanted him to stop. At what point did his body go limp? Is is that what happened? I mean, did he stop resisting? Did he stop fighting you? Did he stop trying to attack you? I and mean, did his arms just fall to the ground, or did his head just slump back, slump forward? Did he slump back? Did he slump into the to the seat or I mean, dashboard? Choking, making horrible, horrible noises. Okay. And I just kept on because I was so scared. Okay. And
I don't even know how the pit got in the other eye. Somehow the pit gets in the left eye? Okay. I think I did it just to make sure. So you think he was dead, but to make sure he was dead, you took the pick out of his right eye and jammed it in his left eye. After killing him, Angela claimed that she didn't know what to do. But what she did do is horrifying enough to affect even the most hardened true crime follower. She said she knew that she had to make James smaller. So she described how she wrapped his head in a plastic bag so it wouldn't bleed in her car. Then she drove him back to her house where she used a hacksaw to dismember him in the garage. And it only gets worse from there. She placed his body parts in pots on the stove and inside her oven. Yes, you are hearing that right. This woman literally told detectives that she tried to boil James's head. And not only that, but remember how she told police that she wished that they would have come sooner? That's because the first time when police met with her on the sidewalk, James' head was boiling inside her home, in the crock pot, on the stove, whatever it is. Disgusting. She said that if the police had just walked a little closer to her house, they would have smelled it. Sick. Now, at one point, Angela's daughter even complained of the smell, but Angela apparently told her that it was just a rat cooking in the oven. Now, that literally made my stomach churn when I heard her say that because, like, I just don't understand. As if that makes it any better. Obviously, you're not going to say you have somebody's head boiling on the stove, but then to say you're cooking a rat in the oven, honestly, it's going to make me gag. I I can't. Like, I honestly can't. So by the time police had actually gotten into her house, she, I'm sorry, guys, I'm still sick. Hold on. Okay. So, (laughs) So by the time police had actually gone into her house, she had loaded all of the body parts into various trash bags and she dumped them in various places around town. And not only that, but she also had her son carry the bags that were too heavy for her to carry. She told both her kids that she had hit a deer and that the bag contained its pieces, which she had chopped up in the garage, where she instructed them not to go. And she kept covering her tracks by texting James's friends and family from his phone even after they had reported him as missing. After her confession, Angela was arrested for second-degree murder in relation to James's murder. While she was in jail, investigators were left scrambling to find body parts all over the county to give this man some semblance of respect after he had been treated just so savagely. But unfortunately, they were only able to find 56 of his 206 bones. Eventually, a grand jury was convened to go over the case, and after hearing Angela's confession, and specifically the comments, Thursday is when I was cooking him, Friday is when I was dumping him, and also, I'm sorry, but I put Jimmy where he belonged, in my opinion at the time, her charges were then upgraded to first-degree murder. So on December 2, 2014, Angela's trial began at the Volusia County Courthouse. While Angela confessed that she killed James, her reasoning was that she did so in self-defense, as she had feared for her life. The prosecution argued that it was a cold-blooded murder with an obvious motive, money. Most of the time when people murder for cash, they do have a lot to gain. But in Angela's case, she couldn't afford to lose more money, and James was costing her money. Angela had struggled financially for most of her adult life, and his actions were causing her more stress and they were making her angry. So, what was true? Was Angela terrified that James would hurt her, or was she angry enough that she wanted to hurt him? That seemed to be cleared up by a witness who was close to Angela and also happened to be the one to help solve the case, Angela's sister. During the trial, Angela's sister shared that around the time that she called the police about Angela acting potentially suicidal, Angela had called a family meeting. It was then that she told her stunned family that she had killed James, and the story she told them didn't sound anything like self-defense. She said that she drugged James while they were drinking, and then said, when he was completely out, I strangled him. So this version of events was a far stretch from her story about a raging James coming at her, forcing her to defend herself. Adding to the cold-bloodedness, she also told her sister that she stabbed James in the eye with that ice pick after she strangled him all to make sure that he was dead. 
Angela's sister appeared very conflicted as she told the jury that there was no struggle and therefore no need for Angela to defend herself. In response, the defense pointed out that Angela was vulnerable and emotionally troubled when she admitted to the killing. In an effort to defend herself, Angela decided to testify to convince the jury that she reasonably feared for her life and acted in self-defense. But her testimony was so inappropriate and downright creepy, considering the topic that she was discussing. And it was just so unbelievable that I honestly don't think that it could convince any jury that she felt remorseful about killing her friend or abusing his corpse in the most gruesome of ways. Angela casually described cutting James's body up in the garage before then starting to cook his body in parts of the oven while her children were still inside the home. She admitted that the smoke and the smell became unbearable enough that her teenagers complained about it, so she then took the body parts, put them in pots, and boiled them, including a foot, a leg, arms, and perhaps most disturbingly, his head. Angela even told the courtroom that she had to remove that ice pick from James's eye because it wouldn't fit in the pot, which is just seriously atrocious and disgusting. I mean, honestly, if she had killed him in self-defense, wouldn't she have just called the police right after? It's hard to argue a point like that when you're so casually talking about how you literally chopped somebody's body up and then cooked all of the parts. I mean, make it make sense. On December 5th, 2014, after ordering a pizza and deliberating for nearly three hours, the jury found Angela guilty of first-degree murder, guilty of abuse of a human corpse, and guilty of tampering with evidence. While the verdict was read, Angela sat emotionless. She remained the same when the judge sentenced her to a life sentence at the same time that the verdict was read. James' family and friends were relieved, knowing that Angela would spend the rest of her life behind bars, but that still didn't fix what she had done, and it will never bring James back. Now, I want to play one more video for you of Angela from the day that she spoke with detectives about what happened to Jimmy. Now, before getting into the details of the crime, Angela describes her relationship with James. In it, she talks about her life as a loner and admits, Jimmy was like my only friend. I was trying to help a friend. Right. Which, I don't have many friends. I mean, you know my life, I'm sure, mm -hmm. upside down. Mm -hmm. um, I've pretty much dropped out of society because of my health problems and this, that, and the other. I have Rob and a few other people I talk to in my yeah. family. Right. But Jimmy was like my only, you know, friend. She sounds genuine and even a little hurt that her only friend took advantage of her. It's honestly just such a stark contrast to the emotionless woman who sat in court and described that same friend's death in such horrifying detail. So what do you think? Do you think Angela, the little girl who spent a lifetime trying to fit in and just finally snapped because she felt betrayed by her only friend and the money issues at play? Or was there always that evil, always lurking beneath the surface? Now get this, we know cases usually have a divide on them in some regard. But Angela actually has a website that is dedicated to her innocence and the argument that she killed him in self-defense, which is wild to me after all of these years. But I guess if she was willing to literally cook a human being, nothing should come as a surprise to me, especially when it comes to her antics. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the case. Let me know what you think below. Thanks again for tuning in with me today on another case. I hope you appreciated the case coverage. Please don't forget, before you head out, do all of the YouTube things, like the video, hit subscribe, make sure you don't miss any future videos, and I also have some very exciting updates coming up in the near future, so don't miss those. As a reminder, we have relaunched, revamped Patreon, giving you guys even more access and more perks, so make sure to check that out in the description, but we are giving you merch giveaways, other giveaways, merch discounts, access to our one-on-one one group chat, personal access, you and I talking. I mean, there's so much stuff in there loaded up, so go check it out. All right, guys, thanks again, and until the next case, stay safe. Bye.